Section 12. A Scrap of Curious History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. Section 12. A Scrap of Curious History. Marion City, on the Mississippi River, in the state of Missouri, a village. Time, 1845. La Bourbourg-les-Bains, France, a village. Time, the end of June, 1894. I was in the one village in that early time. I am in the other now. These times and places are sufficiently wide apart, yet to-day I have the strange sense of being thrust back into that Missourian village, and of reliving certain stirring days that I lived there so long ago. Last Saturday night the life of the President of the French Republic was taken by an Italian assassin. Last night a mob surrounded our hotel, shouting, howling, singing the Marseillaise, and pelting our windows with sticks and stones, for we have Italian waiters, and the mob demanded that they be turned out of the house instantly, to be drubbed, and then driven out of the village. Everybody in the hotel remained up until far into the night, and experienced the several kinds of terror which one reads about in books, which tell of night attacks by Italians and by French mobs, the growing roar of the oncoming crowd, the arrival with rain of stones and a crash of glass, the withdrawal to rearrange plans, followed by a silence ominous, threatening, and harder to bear than even the active siege and the noise. The landlord and the two village policemen stood their ground, and at last the mob was persuaded to go away and leave our Italians in peace. Today four of the ringleaders have been sentenced to heavy punishment of a public sort, and are become local heroes by consequence. That is the very mistake which was at first made in the Missourian village half a century ago. The mistake was repeated and repeated, just as France is doing in these latter months. In our village we had our Ravachals, our Henrys, our Vaillants, and in a humble way our Cesario. I hope I have spelled this name wrong. Fifty years ago we passed through, in all essentials, what France has been passing through during the past two or three years, in the matter of periodical frights, horrors, and shudderings. In several details the parallels are quaintly exact. In that day, for a man to speak out openly and proclaim himself an enemy of negro slavery, was simply to proclaim himself a madman. For he was blaspheming against the holiest thing known to a Missourian, and could not be in his right mind. For a man to proclaim himself an anarchist in France three years ago was to proclaim himself a madman. He could not be in his right mind. Now, the original old first blasphemer against any institution profoundly venerated by a community is quite sure to be in earnest. His followers and imitators may be humbugs and self-seekers, but he himself is sincere. His heart is in his protest. Robert Hardy was our first abolitionist. Awful name. He was a journeyman cooper, and worked in the big cooper shop belonging to the great pork-packing establishment, which was Marion City's chief pride and sole source of prosperity. He was a New Englander, a stranger, and, being a stranger, he was, of course, regarded as an inferior person, for that has been human nature from Adam down. And, of course, also, he was made to feel unwelcome for this is the ancient law with man and the other animals. Hardy was thirty years old, and a bachelor, pale, given to reverie and reading. He was reserved, and seemed to prefer the isolation which had fallen to his lot. He was treated to many side remarks by his fellows, but as he did not resent them it was decided that he was a coward. All of a sudden he proclaimed himself an abolitionist, straight out and publicly, he said that negro slavery was a crime, an infamy. For a moment the town was paralyzed with astonishment. Then it broke into a fury of rage and swarmed toward the cooper shop to lynch Hardy. But the Methodist minister made a powerful speech to them and stayed their hands. He proved to them that Hardy was insane, and not responsible for his words, that no man could be sane and utter such words. So Hardy was saved being insane, he was allowed to go on talking. He was found to be good entertainment. Several nights running he made abolition speeches in the open air, 
and all the town flocked to hear and laugh. He implored them to believe him sane and sincere, and have pity on the poor slaves, and take measures for the restoration of their stolen rights, or in no long time blood would flow. Blood, blood, rivers of blood. It was great fun, but all of a sudden the aspect of things changed. A slave came flying from Palmyra, the county seat, a few miles back, and was about to escape in a canoe to Illinois and freedom, in the dull twilight of the approaching dawn, when the town constable seized him. Hardy happened along and tried to rescue the negro. There was a struggle, and the constable did not come out of it alive. Hardy crossed the river with the negro, and then came back to give himself up. All this took time, for the Mississippi is not a French brook like the Seine, the Loire, and those other rivulets, but is a real river nearly a mile wide. The town was on hand in force by now, but the Methodist preacher and the sheriff had already made arrangements in the interest of order. So Hardy was surrounded by a strong guard, and safely conveyed to the village calaboose, in spite of all the effort of the mob, to get hold of him. The reader will have begun to perceive that this Methodist minister was a prompt man, a prompt man with active hands and a good headpiece. Williams was his name, Damon Williams, Damon Williams in public, Damnation Williams in private, because he was so powerful on that theme and so frequent. The excitement was prodigious. The constable was the first man who had ever been killed in the town. The event was by long odds the most imposing in the town's history. It lifted the humble village into sudden importance. Its name was in everybody's mouth for twenty miles around. And so was the name of Robert Hardy. Robert Hardy the stranger, the despised. In a day he was become the person of most consequence in the region, the only person talked about. As to those other Coopers, they found their position curiously changed. They were important people, or unimportant now, in proportion as to how large or how small had been their intercourse with the new celebrity. The two or three who had really been on a sort of familiar footing with him found themselves objects of admiring interest with the public, and of envy with their shopmates. The village weekly journal had lately gone into new hands. The new man was an enterprising fellow, and he made the most of the tragedy. He issued an extra. Then he put up posters promising to devote his whole paper to matters connected with the great event. There would be a full and intensely interesting biography of the murderer, and even a portrait of him. He was as good as his word. He carved the portrait himself, on the back of a wooden type, and a terror it was to look at. It made a great commotion, for this was the first time the village paper had ever contained a picture. The village was very proud. The output of the paper was ten times as great as it had ever been before, yet every copy was sold. When the trial came on, people came from all the farms around, and from Hannibal, and Quincy, and even from Keokuk, and the courthouse could hold only a fraction of the crowd that applied for admission. The trial was published in the village paper, with fresh and still more trying pictures of the accused. Hardy was convicted, and hanged. A mistake. People came from miles around to see the hanging. They brought cakes and cider, also the women and children, and made a picnic of the matter. It was the largest crowd the village had ever seen. The rope that hanged Hardy was eagerly bought up in inch samples, for everybody wanted a memento of the memorable event. Martyrdom gilded with notoriety has its fascinations. Within one week afterward four young lightweights in the village proclaimed themselves abolitionists. In life Hardy had not been able to make a convert. Everybody laughed at him. But nobody could laugh at his legacy. The four swaggered around with their slouch hats pulled down over their faces, and hinted darkly at awful possibilities. The people were troubled and afraid, and showed it. And they were stunned, too. They could not understand it. Abolitionist had always been a term of shame and horror. Yet here were four young men who were not only not ashamed to bear that name, but were grimly proud of it. Respectable young men they were, too, of good families, and brought up in the church. Ed Smith, the printer's apprentice, nineteen, had been the head Sunday school boy, and had once recited three thousand Bible verses without making a break. Dick Savage, twenty, the baker's apprentice, 
Will Joyce, 22, journeyman blacksmith, and Henry Taylor, 24, tobacco stemmer, were the other three. They were all of a sentimental cast. They were all romance readers. They all wrote poetry, such as it was. They were all vain and foolish. But they had never before been suspected of having anything bad in them. They withdrew from society, and grew more and more mysterious and dreadful. They presently achieved the distinction of being denounced by names from the pulpit, which made an immense stir. This was grandeur. This was fame. They were envied by all the other young fellows now. This was natural. Their company grew, grew alarmingly. They took a name. It was a secret name, and was divulged to no outsider. Publicly they were simply the abolitionists. They had passwords, grips, and signs. They had secret meetings. Their initiations were conducted with gloomy pomps and ceremonies at midnight. They always spoke of Hardy as the martyr, and every little while they moved through the principal street in procession at midnight, black-robed, masked, to the measured tap of the solemn drum, on pilgrimage to the martyr's grave, where they went through with some majestic fooleries and swore vengeance upon his murderers. They gave previous notice of the pilgrimage by small posters, and warned everybody to keep indoors and darken all houses along the route, and leave the road empty. These warnings were obeyed, for there was a skull and crossbone at the top of the poster. When this kind of thing had been going on about eight weeks, a quite natural thing happened. A few men of character and grit woke up out of the nightmare of fear which had been stupefying their faculties, and began to discharge scorn and scoffings at themselves and the community for enduring this child's play, and at the same time they proposed to end it straightway. Everybody felt an uplift life was breathed into their dead spirits, their courage rose, and they began to feel like men again. This was on a Saturday. All day the new feeling grew and strengthened. It grew with a rush. It brought inspiration and cheer with it. Midnight saw a united community full of zeal and pluck, and with a clearly defined and welcome piece of work in front of it. The best organizer and strongest and bitterest talker on that great Saturday was the Presbyterian clergyman who had denounced the original four from his pulpit, Rev. Hiram Fletcher, and he promised to use his pulpit in the public interest again now. On the morrow he had revelations to make, he said, secrets of the dreadful society. But the revelations were never made. At half-past two in the morning the dead silence of the village was broken by a crashing explosion and the town patrol saw the preacher's house spring in a wreck of whirling fragments into the sky. The preacher was killed, together with a negro woman, his only slave and servant. The town was paralyzed again, and with reason. To struggle against a visible enemy is a thing worth while, and there is a plenty of men who stand always ready to undertake it. But to struggle against an invisible one, an invisible one who sneaks in and does his awful work in the dark and leaves no trace, that is another matter. That is a thing to make the bravest tremble and hold back. The cowed populace were afraid to go to the funeral. The man who was to have had a packed church to hear him expose and denounce the common enemy had but a handful to see him buried. The coroner's jury had brought in a verdict of death by the visitation of God, for no witness came forward. If any existed, they prudently kept out of the way. Nobody seemed sorry. Nobody wanted to see the terrible secret society provoked into the commission of further outrages. Everybody wanted the tragedy hushed up, ignored, forgotten, if possible. And so there was a bitter surprise, and an unwelcome one, when Will Joyce, the blacksmith's journeyman, came out and proclaimed himself the assassin. Plainly he was not minded to be robbed of his glory. He made his proclamation and stuck to it. Stuck to it and insisted upon a trial. Here was an ominous thing. Here was a new and peculiarly formidable terror, for a motive was revealed here which society could not hope to deal with successfully. Vanity! Thirst for notoriety! If men were going to kill for notoriety's sake, and to win the glory of newspaper renown, a big trial, and a showy execution, what possible invention of man could discourage or deter them? The town was in a sort of panic. It did not know what to do. However, the grand jury had to take hold of the matter. It had no choice. 
it brought in a true bill and presently the case went to the county court the trial was a fine sensation the prisoner was the principal witness for the prosecution he gave a full account of the assassination he furnished even the minutest particulars how he deposited his keg of powder and laid his train from the house to such and such a spot how george ronalds and henry hart came along just then smoking and he borrowed hart's cigar and fired the train with it shouting down with all slave tyrants and how hart and ronalds made no effort to capture him but ran away and had never come forward to testify yet but they had to testify now and they did and pitiful it was to see how reluctant they were and how scared the crowded house listened to joyce's fearful tale with a profound and breathless interest and in a deep hush which was not broken till he broke it himself in concluding with a roaring repetition of his death to all slave tyrants which came so unexpectedly and so startlingly that it made every one present catch his breath and gasp the trial was put in the paper with biography and large portrait with other slanderous and insane pictures and the addition sold beyond imagination. The execution of Joyce was a fine and picturesque thing. It drew a vast crowd. Good places in trees and seats on rail fences sold for half a dollar apiece. Lemonade and gingerbread stands had great prosperity. Joyce recited a furious and fantastic and denunciatory speech on the scaffold, which had imposing passages of schoolboy eloquence in it, and gave him a reputation on the spot as an orator, and his name, later, in the Society's records, of the Martyr Orator. He went to his death breathing slaughter and charging his society to avenge his murder. If he knew anything of human nature, he knew that, to plenty of young fellows present in that great crowd, he was a grand hero, and enviably situated. He was hanged. It was a mistake. Within a month from his death, the society which he had honored had twenty new members, some of them earnest, determined men. They did not court distinction in the same way, but they celebrated his martyrdom. The crime which had been obscure and despised had become lofty and glorified. Such things were happening all over the country. Wild-brained martyrdom was succeeded by uprising and organization. Then, in natural order, followed riot, insurrection, and the rack and restitution of war. It was bound to come, and it would naturally come in that way. It has been the manner of reform since the beginning of the world. End of section 12. A Scrap of Curious History. Become local heroes by consequence. That is the very mistake which was at first made in the Missourian village half a century ago. The mistake was repeated and repeated, just as France is doing in these latter months. In our village we had our Ravachals, our Henrys, our Vaillants, and in a humble way our Cesario. I hope I have spelled this name wrong. Fifty years ago we passed through, in all essentials, what France has been passing through during the past two or three years, in the matter of periodical frights, horrors, and shudderings. In several details the parallels are quaintly exact. In that day, for a man to speak out openly and proclaim himself an enemy of negro slavery was simply to proclaim himself a madman. For he was blaspheming against the holiest thing known to a Missourian, and could not be in his right mind. For a man to proclaim himself an anarchist in France three years ago was to proclaim himself a madman. He could not be in his right mind. Now, the original old first blasphemer against any institution profoundly venerated by a community is quite sure to be in earnest. Section 12. A Scrap of Curious History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. Section 12. A Scrap of Curious History. Marion City, on the Mississippi River, in the state of Missouri, a village. Time, 1845. La Bourbourg-les-Bains, France, a village. Time, the end of June, 1894. I was in the one village in that early time. I am in the other now. 
these times and places are sufficiently wide apart far into the night and experience the several kinds of terror which one reads about in books which tell of night attacks by italians and by french mobs the growing roar of the oncoming crowd the arrival with rain of stones and a crash of glass the withdrawal to rearrange plans followed by a silence ominous threatening and harder to bear than even the active siege and the noise the landlord and the two village policemen stood their ground and at last the mob was persuaded to go away and leave our italians in peace Today four of the ringleaders have been sentenced to heavy punishment of a public sort and are but yet today i have the strange sense of being thrust back into that missourian village and of reliving certain stirring days that i lived there so long ago last saturday night the life of the president of the french republic was taken by an italian assassin last night a mob surrounded our hotel shouting howling singing the marseillaise and pelting our windows with sticks and stones for we have italian waiters and the mob demanded that they be turned out of the house instantly to be drubbed and then driven out of the village everybody in the hotel remained up until five